Well, thank you. I, uh, too, very much appreciate the opportunity to um, come and uh, present. And as you'll see, uh, uh, pediatrics is uh, pretty much my passion. The reason for this is that uh, children with autism or epilepsy or asthma or inflammatory bowel disease or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, once they turn 18, they no longer become healthy adults. Um, the consequences of administering nephrotoxic or ototoxic medications in the NICU do not magically go away when these um, survivors turn 18. And so my bias is that uh, early and effective intervention may actually change the course of the disease as these uh, uh, children become adults. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the grant su uh, support first because this generally is what I forget to, uh, to mention. And interestingly, the bottom um, grant did not make its way into the uh, list we saw yesterday, and that's because uh, it turns out, is it feedback? Can you, can you hear feedback? A bit. Um, did not make its way into the, uh, the report, and, and as it turns out, I didn't use the uh, term pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics anywhere uh, in the uh, abstract or the title, and that's because we're interested in precision therapeutics uh, for, uh, for children. And uh, so in the time allotted to me, I'm really going to superficially address these four points. And you can read them, and they will come up in, in additional slides. Um, but as I alluded to yesterday, in, um, in terms of implementation, we don't feel like we have much to implement until such time as we generate um, the information that needs to be implemented. And uh, in constructing how it is that we are going to develop this information, we are sort of reversing the traditional dose exposure response paradigm to work backwards from response. And uh, this is because we feel, the practitioners feel, that uh, when they implement a therapeutic innovation, whether it's small molecule or behavioral or anything else, generally they do so with some sort of um, outcome or response in mind. And so the questions that we work through are, uh, you know, what is the therapeutic goal of the intervention? How much small molecule, active form of the small molecule needs to be in the system to have a high probability of that response? And then how does the dose have to be individualized to achieve that uh, target exposure? And so um, just to move into this first phase, clinically useful guidance. Here is information taken from the product monograph for atomoxetine. This is a uh, medication used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children. In fact, it was developed um, uh, for this indication. And this is the, uh, the verbiage in the product monograph. It says, poor metabolizers, PMs of CYP2D6, have a tenfold higher AUC area under the curve, so a measure of systemic exposure, and a fivefold higher peak concentration compared to extensive metabolizers. Down at the bottom, it says that there may be some dosage adjustment required. Uh, actually, I, I ask pharmacy students when I present them this, okay, tenfold difference in exposure, how much will the dose need to be adjusted in a poor metabolizer to achieve the same exposure? Uh, apparently, this is a very difficult calculation. <laughs> and it appears to be difficult because uh, when you actually look at the guidance, uh, the starting dose is the same, 0.5 milligrams per kilo whether you are a poor metabolizer or an extensive metabolizer, despite the tenfold difference in uh, systemic exposure. And um, we can go into why, the, why, this, uh, uh, why this may be, but from a implementation perspective in terms of helping uh, practitioners guide the dosing of atomoxetine given information relevant to that individual, their CYP2D6 genotype, uh, this is not helpful. And so we've, uh, we're approaching this problem by conducting genotype stratified pharmacokinetic studies to try to get, uh, using an efficient design, um, to capture how much variability there might be across the population. Now, when we compare, um, if you look at the uh, median values here, there is a 14-fold difference uh, between the PM population or group, it's not a population, it's four individuals, in red versus the blues that have uh, at least two functional alleles. 
Now, it turns out that it's not possible, it's possible to give kids 0.5 milligrams per kilo, but you have to mix and match the available solid oral dosage forms. So we thought, well, some of this variability may be due to the fact that the children didn't actually get exactly 0.5 milligrams per kilo. So if we correct for the dose that's administered, we can get that difference between PMs and EMs down to 11-fold. So that's pretty much what's in the product monograph. What's relevant from an individualized dosing perspective or a precision therapeutics perspective is the fact that this same weight-based dose gave a 50-fold range in exposures if you go with the uncorrected data. 50-fold, that's more than one and a half orders of magnitude. Um, but we can get that down to 30-fold if we correct for, for dose. Now, the way that um, community practitioners will uh, uh, prescribe this drug is uh, what's shown there in the left-hand panel. So it's a 50-fold exposure for children given the same weight-based dose. So you can see that where the, some of the challenges are now in terms of um, um, implementing a drug. As it turns out, and I don't have time to go into this story, the consequence of the FDA-approved dosing guidelines is that those individuals who are in green or blue are unlikely to achieve concentrations that have been associated with clinical response. So that's probably f at least 40% of the population. And they are paying the price for making sure that those individuals in red do not have concentrations that are too high. So um, in, in, the, in the course of conducting some of these genotype stratified PK studies, we have um, um, stumbled upon some unknown unknowns and, uh, and they have taught us a, an important lesson and that is the limitations of using uh, available adult data to inform the design of studies that we're going to conduct in children. And I'm going to give you one example of this. This is a study of simvastatin in uh, dyslipidemic uh, children conducted by uh, a member of our group, a pediatric cardiologist by the name of John Wagner. And basically, uh, simvastatin requires hydrolysis of an inactive lactone to the active acid. And just to cut to the, uh, to the, to, to the quick here, um, we made the assumption that uh, clearance in kids might actually be quicker uh, than in adults because uh, CYP3A activity is responsible for the elimination of the uh, acid and the lactone. Um, as it turns out, uh, we were able to replicate the genotype-phenotype associations in, uh, seen in adults, except the magnitude of effect between the TT uh, homozygotes and the CC variant group at position 521 is six-fold as opposed to three-fold in adults. But the most important um, thing was that 25% of the participants in this uh, genotype stratified PK study did not have simvastatin acid concentrations that were detectable. And it looks like because the, uh, the half-life, we couldn't get a half-life because it was uh, basically a flat line in most of these kids, it looks like rate-limiting formation. So there is something going on in children related to the conversion of the lactone to the um, acid that uh, needs to be looked uh, into. Uh, but we would not have anticipated the possibility of rate-limiting lactone formation based on the uh, available evidence from adults. So there is much more to learn. Um, John is conducting, um, has completed a pravastatin study in these same kids. He's about 75% of the way through uh, atorvastatin and versuvastatin. And I can tell you that there is something new uh, that we've learned with respect to pravastatin as well, and the extent, uh, the question is, uh, to what extent are these actually relevant to adults as well? You can find clues to what's going on if you go way, way, way back in the literature. We would have never looked there except for finding these, uh, these results. Um, variability in drug response. This is another big bugaboo of mine uh, in that uh, um, when we are looking at drug response, um, there's at least two possibilities, and Dr. Weinschelbaum has added a third. Um, the first is that uh, some people may not respond because of inadequate exposure, and I think the, the uh, atomoxetine story is an example of this. Other individuals may not respond because there is something fundamentally different, either because of genetic variation in the drug target or developmental uh, differences in the drug target, if we're talking about uh, children, and we need to be able to distinguish between those. Um, Dr. Weinschelbaum pointed out that uh, administration of a drug um, can also add, um, sort of unmask uh, perhaps uh, uh, differences uh, or be able to, we may be able to stratify uh, a patient population by 
um, disease on the basis of response to a medication rather than by uh, clinical symptoms. So anyway, being able to uh, distinguish between um, uh, the reason for lack of response is going to be um, very important because the uh, treatment decisions will be uh, quite different. For example, if it's low exposure, you can increase the dose. If, uh, if somebody is inherently not going to respond to the medication, uh, you'll want to change the medication, but, but ultimately you would like to be able to make those decisions before you prescribe the drug, a drug the first time. And so conceptually, this is a very simplistic approach to it. Um, these are three dose response curves that are shifted twofold. And uh, I picked twofold because uh, the minus 1639 G to A polymorphism in morphine, if you go back to the original uh, New England Journal of Medicine article, it was about a 1.8 uh, fold shift in, in uh, the uh, level of messenger RNA expression for VKORC1 that was associated with that variant. And the point of this slide is simply to show you that if you target the same therapeutic goal, that the exposures that are going to be necessary to achieve that same therapeutic goal are going to differ depending on what the drug target genotype is or what the drug target level of expression is. And so this is one of the arguments for, for looking at drug response and looking at things uh, there first and trying to control exposure to um, maximize the probability of clinical success given the drug target genotype. Finally, I think one of the challenges is considering individual patients, whether they are pediatric patients or adults, as individuals. And, and here is an example. Here's what we usually do, is we, we like to look at the distribution of um, patients who participate in our studies, and we will do a frequency histogram. Here's one for age, or one for height of 189 kids that participated in a, a CYP2D6 longitudinal phenotyping study that we conducted where we were looking um, to see if uh, CYP2D6 and 3A activity changed as uh, children went through puberty. Um, when it comes to treating individual patients, though, it's not so much where they are on a population distribution, but what they look like as individuals. And so in this uh, figure here, all I'm doing is, is illustrating the point that a child can be defined by a number of characteristics, their height and weight at a particular age, whether they are male or female, so uh, red or blue, and uh, in terms of the size of the spheres, this is indicating um, uh, development, stage of development, Tanner stage, for example. Now, if I could show you a sixth dimension, I could show you their six two, uh, CYP2D6 genotype or any other characteristic. But the idea is to start thinking of individuals as individuals and, and uh, trying to characterize those factors that make them individuals if uh, we truly intend to implement um, uh, pediatric uh, uh, precision therapeutics. I have five minutes left. I can't believe I have five minutes left because usually I go over. So the take home message is we are trying to develop this data set. We call the program uh, Goldilocks. Uh, the concept is very easy to get across to uh, patients and parents. Uh, not too big, not too small, the dose of medication that's just right for your child. It turns out the Department of Philanthropy can work with this quite well as, um, in, in terms of their engagement with the, uh, the, uh, the community to uh, raise, raise funds for the, uh, the hospital. And so the, the, the Goldilocks acronym really is intended to um, incorporate those factors that uh, make each child unique, their genome, their stage of development, and to use that information to uh, develop these uh, dosing algorithms that uh, ultimately will optimize uh, drug therapy. Uh, as I mentioned, we are pursuing this response exposure dose paradigm, and that is we're hoping to, we are focusing on the drug target genotype, individualizing exposure so that we can minimize the, um, the contribution of variability in drug exposure as a contributing vac uh, factor to variability in drug response, and this is a um, particularly important for drugs like atomoxetine or any other compound that is subject to um, uh, polymorphic uh, um, uh, genes involved in their disposition. Now, yesterday I mentioned one other thing, and that is that it's important to, um, to educate uh, patients and their families about some of these uh, rather complex concepts that we are trying to address. And so this is uh, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Sue uh, Rahman, 
has uh, spent a lot of time working with the uh, Art Institute uh, in town in Kansas City and the students of that Art Institute to come up with ways of illustrating these, uh, these concepts. And so here is uh, the concept of the uh, genes in your body being uh, responsible for breaking down um, a medication and that depending on what your genes are, uh, you may be a turtle. And for the record, I am a turtle. I am a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer. Um, you can be a bike, you can be a car, or at the far end of the spectrum, you can be a rocket. And you won't be able to see it, but uh, the visual, here we've got a person who's got a lot of um, drug in their system. They're not all that happy. And here's an individual that doesn't have very much drug in, in their uh, body, and actually they look frazzled. The people at the front will be able to see they're, they're frazzled. So this was, uh, this was tailored for our ADHD um, study. But, but basically, um, it is really important to be able to communicate. If we're going to generate the knowledge, we have to be able to communicate to patients and uh, their parents how important it is to be um, active participants in this uh, process. And so just to close, I mentioned that we have uh, embedded within our division pediatric subspecialists. Um, they work together with individuals with expertise in pharmacogenetics, Andrea Gatic, for example. Um, in vitro phenotyping, one of the other things that we're doing is looking to see for some drugs where it may not be possible to do a um, genotype stratified PK study, we're looking at creating uh, virtual uh, children using physiology-based uh, pharmacokinetic uh, platform built around uh, drug biotransformation from individual pediatric liver microsomal samples. This is actually working out uh, not too badly for, uh, for atomoxetine. Um, analytical chemistry, the quantitative pharmacology. And then these are the uh, individuals who are really involved with um, um, taking, this, uh, taking this Goldilocks approach into their patient population. You'll see that we have rheumatology, developmental and behavioral sciences, infectious diseases, allergy and immunology, neonatology, gastroenterology, adolescent medicine, oncology, cardiology, and rehabilitation medicine. That's a, rehabilitation medicine is our newest one. But the idea, um, our institution is committed to, uh, to moving this uh, concept into all the pediatric uh, subspecialties. We certainly appreciate their support, and I appreciate your um, intention, uh, attention and, uh, and hope you'll take home uh, a passion for uh, implementing uh, pediatrics as part of your, uh, your programs. Thank you. That has to be the first time I've been on time in the presentation. <laughs> Great. Time for questions. Terry, yes. Steve, no, this is this is really exciting. Um, I, I'm. I think you may have said this, but I but I missed it. Um, you're currently implementing in these sites that you've or these specialties, but your plan is to do it across all inpatient and outpatient. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not implementing anywhere. These are the uh, the individuals who are um, collecting the data. Um, collecting the data that, that can be used to implement. I would say that uh, um, the CYP2D6 and, and meds for uh, developmental behavioral sciences, so um, hopefully SSRIs and some atypical antipsychotics, um, will probably, that and um, statins in dyslipidemic kids will probably get to an implementation phase um, sooner uh, than some of the others. Um, uh, the, uh, let's see, the infectious diseases is actually a Bactrim hypersensitivity focus, so that will be longer. So, so just as a, as a follow-up, um, if, if you haven't implemented yet, could you consider uh, randomizing so, that, so we could actually generate some evidence from your experience? Yeah, I, I shouldn't say that we're not implementing. We, are, we do have an individualized pediatric therapeutics uh, clinic, clinic where um, uh, we do uh, incorporate pharmacogenetics, genomics, I would consider that to be a, more like a forensic uh, application. These are children who are coming with a specific problem and, um, and uh, we uh, uh, get the pharmacogenomic testing done to help um, solve those problems. We also have a consult service. Uh, so it, it's more reactive um, right now. The focus is on developing the tools to allow us, uh, we want to take this uh, into the ADHD population first with atomoxetine. It's a third-line drug because our clinicians think it doesn't work, 
they would prefer to use it because uh, uh, that would allow them to avoid some of the behavioral um, changes that they see in kids on stimulants as well as the appetite suppressant effects. So we're not there yet, but we're moving there. So consider randomizing. Okay, our next question is with Bob. Uh, so pediatricians are um, used to uh, adjusting dose, um, so it's not just one dose fits all because there are different stages of development and different weight and body surface area, and they're used to doing that. Do you think that that makes it easier to get them to engage with this kind of dose adjustment for pharmacogenomics than for adults? Yeah, I don't know if I, uh, I it, in our place, I think it does for two reasons. Number one, our clinical pharmacology program has been there for 20 years, and um, we are able to do some of these studies, genotype stratified PK studies, um, in kids who are not receiving um, the medications typically, um, just because of the culture that's built up over those 20, 20 years. So I don't know that everybody, what I'm going to say is generalizable to everybody. The other uh, factor that I think um, will allow our clinicians to uh, um, be more accepting of this is the fact that I'm not taking this to them, those people are, are taking it to them. So it's a cardiologist who's going to help them understand um, uh, SLC01B1 pharmacogenetics and statins and uh, CYP2C9 and BKORC1 in, in uh, the Fontan patients who get uh, um, warfarin. Um, it's going to be the practitioners that do it. We've already found out that uh, uh, Jazzy Ann Tolbert, the, uh, the oncologist, uh, she's been, uh, her colleagues have come up to her and said, well, we really like to know what it is that you know, but we don't have time to do um, like a two-year clinical pharmacology fellowship on top of the uh, pediatric subspecialty fellowship. And so now we've, uh, Jazzy uh, and uh, another, <clears throat> excuse me, another member of the division, uh, Jen Lowry, have, have uh, developed a, um, a, a boot camp where they will, where uh, practitioners will get uh, an intensive course on clinical pharmacology principles and pharmacogenetics. So there are some people who want it. Um, there's uh, quite a few other people that would like to ask you questions. We're going to take the prerogative of the moderator and say that we'll please hold those questions for the discussion at the end because we want to hear our next speaker. Lori Cavallari um, from University of Florida, and Lori's going to be talking about evaluating outcomes with genotype-guided antiplatelet therapy.